decided we have to make this thing bigger. It can't, it can't house all the people who want to hear this lecture. And, and they talked about tearing down Yavapai Observation Station. The Park Service developed a plan to raise the building and build something new and bigger in its place. And fortunately, the historians <laughs> jumped in and said, no, this is too important a historical structure. And, uh, and it was saved. Uh, that's Eddie McKee there uh, doing some work down in the canyon. Um, through certain Park Service policies, he wasn't able to stay on as a chief ranger. And I'm not sure what those policies were, but that's, that's the vague uh, expression that you get in historical documents, that he wanted to stay on as naturalist, but he had to retire. And he went down to uh, become director, assistant director here at the uh, Museum of Northern Arizona, director of research. Uh, and then he went on to, the, uh, to uh, the Department of Geology at the University of Arizona and as a professor. He was there for a while and then rose up the ranks to become chair of the Geology Department at the U of A. He worked for the U.S. Geological Survey for a while and uh, eventually passed away in 1984. But he was one of the founders and the early secretary, which back then men were secretaries and the secretaries usually ran the organizations. We would call them an executive director now, but back then they were called secretaries. He was secretary of the Grand Canyon Association for many years while he was uh, chief uh, naturalist and, and ranger at the park. As uh, one of the um, 1950s and 60s era, um, that's it, Paul, Paul Schultz, who was chief naturalist in the 1950s, said that the Yavapai geology lecture was the park story, the whole damn story. That's pretty much what it was uh, still in the 1950s. Um, by the 1960s, some other types of interpretation uh, started coming into the park. Uh, the Park Service generally resisted, or the Grand Canyon National Park generally resisted most other types of interpretation. Oh, here's an interesting anecdote. How many people have been to Tucson Ruin and Museum inside the park? Uh, a good, good half of you. Um, that's a archaeological exhibit. It's an old uh, Ho'okam, not Ho'okam, I just came up here from Phoenix and so <laughs> thinking the Ho'okam. It's an old um, uh, ancestral Puebloan village and uh, there was an archaeologist who uh, in the 19 teens and 1920s was excavating that site and finding all kinds of wonderful stuff and he said, you know what, you've got, they're, they're everywhere up here on the You've got old ruin sites all over the place. This, this rim area was extensively occupied a long time ago. Why aren't you interpreting that too? You've got Mesa Verde and you talk about the ancient peoples who lived here. Why not talk about it here? And the park, I have a PhD student uh, named Sarah Bowl Gerke who wrote her dissertation on the history of interpretation at Grand Canyon National Park. And this is what she discovered. This little debate going on in the 1920s about um, what should we do with the, you know, with the human story, the historical story of the Grand Canyon? And the park interpreters, the superintendent, the chief naturalist said, nah, we're going to let those other parks in the four corners interpret human history and archaeological history. We're going to focus on geology here at the Grand Canyon. And so they told this guy, no, we don't want to do anything. We don't want to interpret that. That's for other parks. We're just going to look at geology, and this is a wilderness park, not a people park. The archaeologist said, such a shame. How about if I can raise the money to build a museum, will you let me build a museum here in the park next to the ruin to interpret it? You don't have to do anything. I'll, I'll do it. And the Park Service sort of reluctantly said, well, okay. And he raised the money and they built the um, Tucson Museum. It looks much like it today, like it did back then. And the year that the museum opened, I'm sorry, I can't remember what year it was, maybe 1932. Do you remember London by any chance? The year that it opened, it was the most popular attraction in the park. More people went to the Tucson Museum than even went to the Yavapai Observation Station. So that was a rude awakening for the park service. And they said, well, I guess our visitors want to learn also about the human history. Uh, but they still dragged their feet for a while. It wasn't until the 1960s that they really got serious about telling the human history of the park and also started getting more and more serious about telling uh, the ecological story of the park. It was a geological story until the 1960s. All right, a little bit of review here. Um, to me, and I hope or expect most of you, 
Um, you see the Grand Canyon as a kind of a mind-bending landscape. It's a place that's hard to grasp and understand, a place that fills you with you know, a sense of awe and mystery. It's not easily grokked. Anybody remember the word grok? Robert Heinlein? No, no, it was, where did grok come from? It was Robert Heinlein? Okay, I got it right. I was thinking it was Ray Bradbury for a second. That's mingling souls. Sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here. There is a great book by Robert Heinlein where he in invented this term grok, which means to really intellectually, you know, encompass and understand something on a deep level. Um, the Grand Canyon is hard to grok. In a few short generations, the Grand Canyon and the science done there helped to revolutionize our concepts of time. And the canyon itself really influenced the development of geoscience. But some pockets of resistance to understanding and accepting deep time concepts remained then and now. And here's an example. I went online a couple of weeks ago and found something. How many people have used Wikipedia? There is something called Creation Wiki. They have their own Wikipedia site for creationists. And I found on Creation Wiki the following quote on the home page for the Grand Canyon. The formation of the Grand Canyon is a problem for uniformitarian geologists. Any uniformitarian geologists in here that think the formation of the Grand Canyon is a problem for them? Uh, no, no hands? Okay. It's a problem, he said, for uniformitarian geologists, but it fits well into the framework of the biblical global flood. Exposed within the walls of the Grand Canyon are rocks that were likely created during the creation along with massive layers resulting from sedimentation during the flood. Flood geologists such as Stephen Austin assert that during the last half of the year of the flood, I love that, during the last half of the year of the flood, <laughs> the great flood happened over one year, and in half of that one year, the Colorado Plateau was lifted by tectonic forces more than a mile above sea level. That is catastrophic. <laughs> I would love to have been there to see that. So the Colorado Plateau was lifted in six months to a mile above sea level, and Noah's flood carved the Grand Canyon. This is today on the web, so it must be true, because I found it on the web. Um, all of those books are from their website. They say, buy the Grand Canyon packet, and you click on it, and that's what you get is the Grand Canyon packet, and Stephen Austin's work is in there, uh, as well as several other books about how the Grand Canyon was catastrophically created uh, <coughs> pretty recent. Well, what is the future of geoscience at Grand Canyon? My hopes for geoscience education that we keep geoscience education prominent at the park and not shy away from it just because it might be controversial. That we use Grand Canyon to enhance visitors' understanding of the age of the earth and the nature of scientific inquiry. How do we come to these understandings about the formation of landscapes? And about the age of the earth. Uh, there's a story there about how we develop and gain and test knowledge that we should be teaching at the Grand Canyon. Uh, we should continue to promote science education as a tool for both uh, personal and cultural edification. This really is about um, gaining deeper understanding, maturing, developing a uh, clearer understanding of our world and ourselves. And hopefully